I recently made a video about cognitive bias in medical research, reasons that medical studies can reach inaccurate conclusions which are inevitably the ones that are quoted in blogs and magazines and wellness YouTube channels. One of the motivations for making that video was seeing so many comments praising YouTube videos that promote complete quackery simply because they have cited sources, as if that somehow magically makes what they're saying factual. That video sought to explain why not all sources are the same, and hopefully gave a few pointers how to look past the silly headlines and appraise the source material. You'd be surprised how many national headlines are based on a study of six people, or six mice, or even better, six petri dishes. This video is about a different type of cognitive bias, the ones affecting me and my colleagues when we're trying to make a diagnosis and a plan for a patient. Many of them can be applied to any profession, but I'm going to concentrate on how doctors can make mistakes. But don't expect this to be some hatchet job on the medical profession. I know that a lot of doctors see criticising their colleagues as a way to build a following online, portraying themselves as some iconoclast standing up against the tyranny of corrupt corporate shills. I'm not one of those people. I'm very proud to be a member of the medical profession. I'm proud of my colleagues. I believe 99.5% of them are doing the best job that they can for the right reasons. But Doctors are all human, at least for the time being, and humans are susceptible to bias. The next thing to say is that diagnosing a patient is complicated. It's something you continue to learn and improve your entire career. I mean, look, the creators of House got eight series out of the challenge of diagnosis. And in fact, it was originally pitched as a kind of medical whodunit with House as a Sherlock Holmes type character. And indeed, medicine is often like detective work. So doctors have to use techniques to narrow down the list of potential diagnoses. And occasionally this leads to the correct diagnosis being erroneously excluded. Some of the terms for these biases are official, some I've just made up in response to things I've observed on the job. Some can affect doctors and patients. For example, novelty bias, the belief that something new is better than the previous iteration. The angriest comments I get rant and rave about how I'm stuck in the past, a pathetic excuse for a doctor that isn't moving with the times, and that waiting for evidence is denying my patients the latest fantastic treatments. What does this disruptive approach remind you of? Silicon Valley, technology. Most of the things in our lives do keep getting better as time goes by, but just as Windows Vista, Mumble Wrap, and Disney remakes can demonstrate, sometimes new isn't always better. Medicines aren't like computer components. They don't keep getting better with every generation. There is no medical Moore's law. The history of medicine is littered with abandoned therapies that turned out to be garbage. And drug companies take advantage of this. They get an old drug and they tweak the molecule slightly, repackage it, say it's a new improved formula, way more powerful. Oh, and by the way, it's 10 times the price. To avoid long-term injury, seek immediate medical help for an erection lasting more than four hours. Stop taking Viagra and call your doctor right away if you experience a sudden decrease or loss in vision or hearing. Ask your doctor about Viagra. In places like America, they even advertise direct to patients who then go into their doctor and say, I'd like crassisimab. And if the doctor says, you know, I'd like to wait for some evidence, then they're the fool that's stuck in the past. But don't think I'm giving doctors a free pass. Sometimes they're just as taken in by the marketing hype. Innovators are exciting. Everybody wants to be the Elon Musk of medicine. Nobody wants to be the nerd in the corner saying, actually, I don't think this is going to work. But this isn't Silicon Valley. Need I say more than Theranos? We start with little Timmy Willy. Yes, that is a character from Beatrix Potter. Attending the hospital to see Dr. Debbie Doctor. Yes, her surname is Doctor. It's quite common amongst Parsis. Timmy opens with, Doctor Doctor, I feel like a pair of curves. If you make a Doctor Doctor joke, I will gut you like a fish. But please call me Debbie. Uh, okay, kind of unprofessional Debbie, but that's not the focus of the video, so let's press on. Timmy has lower chest pain. Debbie notices that he is breathing rapidly. Let's skip the whole history part and assume that Debbie feels that the possibilities are chest infection, heart disease, or a stomach problem. She sees that Timmy is slim and normally in good health, so she decides that heart disease is unlikely. I'll talk more about Bayesian thinking in future videos, but suffice to say that being overweight does increase your likelihood of having heart disease. However, it does not logically follow from that that only obese people have heart attacks, nor that thin people do not have heart attacks. So Debbie has been guilty of stereotyping. Other examples might be making an assumption based on somebody's sex or their race. Even though he describes a pain that is extending down to the Timmy tummy, the fact that Debbie noticed his breathing first makes her gravitate towards her initial thought of a chest infection. Placing undue importance on your first instinct is called anchoring. 
She looks at his blood test results and sees that he has an elevated level of a cardiac enzyme and the computer readout says high risk of heart attack, even though there are many medical problems that can cause this particular blood test to go up. So she rules heart disease back in, despite having just ruled it out a few seconds earlier. In the same way that people trust their GPS sat-nav more than their own ability to read a map these days, she believes the computer. You've probably heard about this one, it's automation bias. Debbie is studying for her MRCP exam, a bit like the British version of board exams. And last night she studied atypical pneumonia. Even though they are much less common than the more conventional causes of chest infections, she thinks that Coxiella burnetti, Q fever, or Francisella tularensis, tularemia, are likely, perhaps because she has just been studying them 12 hours ago. This is availability bias. The converse also occurs. You're much less likely to diagnose something that you haven't studied or thought about for many years. When I was studying for my MRCP, I saw a man with a 20-year history of various medical problems that had eluded any diagnosis despite having seen dozens of specialists. In probably my most Halcyon moment, I diagnosed him with the exceedingly rare condition of a yellow nail syndrome, because I had just been studying about it, and I became the toast of the doctor's mess for a day. So availability bias isn't bad, right? Well, you've got to consider that in the context of these incidents. Is this ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency? N no, it's a tummy bug. Have you considered familial Mediterranean fever? No, this is the flu. This looks like bullous pemphigoid complicated by necrotizing fasciitis and cutaneous porphyria. <sighs> no Rohin. It's an ingrown toenail. Side note, I was exhibiting Dunning-Kruger, or overconfidence bias, where confidence spikes with a little experience before dropping precipitously as you realize how little you know, and in my case, what a dick you have been. Debbie has exaggerated the probability of rare but serious diagnoses, which is a bias, but one that's often necessary. This prevalence distortion is where you place a serious illness higher on your list of diagnoses than its actual prevalence in the population would dictate. For example, we do hundreds of CT scans to look for the catastrophic condition of aortic dissection because we're so keen to avoid missing it. It's often fatal. So most of the tests that we request will come back normal, and that's probably fine. But at what point does it cross into over-investigation? Debbie feels that a chest infection has the best outcome out of the potential diagnoses, so subconsciously she might want that to be the diagnosis because she wants the best for Timmy, and I've seen this referred to as value bias. Debbie then spots several test results that support her diagnosis. Slightly raised temperature, inflammatory markers, a bit of shortness of breath, even though these could actually all fit with the other diagnoses as well. She then misses or brushes off a couple of test results that don't quite fit her diagnosis. You know this one, it's confirmation bias. She follows the antimicrobial guidelines for someone with pneumonia. Timmy doesn't meet any criteria for a severe infection, but Debbie's a bit worried about him. She's a caring doctor, and she wants him to get home as soon as possible to see his kids. So she adds in another antibiotic, a stronger one, and the antiviral Tamiflu. Various forms of this have various names, including exception bias where clinicians think that their patient is special and that guidelines drawn up from thousands of data points and other patients don't apply to them. This is a tough one. Sometimes they are right, but too often we mentally exempt our patients, thinking we're giving them the best shot. However, sometimes if we add in another treatment, it might not actually be doing anything, and in rare examples, it might even make things worse. For example, antibiotic resistance. Dr. Debbie's boss, Professor Gregory Garage, comes to review the patient on his ward round. Do speak, young man. I've got a pain like, right here. Aha! Pancreatitis. With experience comes pattern recognition. Professor Garage's mental algorithm to reach a diagnosis is different to Debbie's. He's going to be far quicker, he's going to get the right diagnosis more often, but Pattern recognition can sometimes be fooled when a patient presents in an unusual way. Professor Garage thinks it's a surgical problem, but he remembers a patient who sued him in whom he missed a heart problem. So now he places undue importance on ruling out heart disease in pretty much everyone he sees with chest or abdominal pain, and he orders a scan to exclude a heart problem. This could be called litigation bias. I really want to focus on commission and omission bias. The most hallowed words in medicine are primum non nocere, first do no harm. It's our prime directive. So when in doubt, doctors might err on the side of caution and decide that the best course of action is to do nothing. Worried that if they prescribe the wrong treatment, they might actually bring harm to the patient, which is absolutely what they don't want to do. 
The corollary is also true, which is the urge to just do something. For example, if a patient comes in with a viral infection and feels like crap, the patient wants something done, the doctor wants to do something, they don't want to feel helpless, so they prescribe some antibiotics, which aren't going to have any effect on the virus, but the patient feels better that something's been done, the doctor feels that they've been proactive, and the patient just gets better on their own anyway. So I hope you can see that the urge to do something or the desire to avoid any potential harm are both entirely natural and normal responses, and a lot of the time they're entirely correct. Learning when they aren't the right thing to do is one of the hardest skills in medicine. Okay, uh, now Timmy's luck is going to change because I need to demonstrate some more biases. Sorry, Timmy. Debbie asks for a colorectal consult from Miss Poopy. Yes, that is an Italian surname, who thinks that Timmy might have a large bowel problem. The tendency to diagnose problems you're experienced with is familiarity bias. A scan, however, confirms that an upper GI surgeon is needed. The surgeon, Mr. Choppy, yes, that is a Chonga surname from KwaZulu Natal, well spotted, sees Timmy and recommends surgery. Professor Garage is a non-surgical doctor, so recommends a non-surgical therapy. This is also a type of familiarity bias. Look out for this on the internet. Beware the doctor who zealously endorses one small area of medicine or one movement or sells lots of books about one particular therapy, because chances are they will recommend it when there are better options available. I see a lot of doctors who have Twitter handles like The Vegan Doctor or Fat Cures Everything or Stop Taking Tablets Forever. Now, while all three of those things are great in the right situation, I worry that if they make it central to their whole personality, they lose objectivity. The non-surgical option is the traditional treatment for Timmy's condition, which is to cover yourself in jelly while singing Pink Floyd, but Mr. Choppy recommends a brand new operation called the endoscopic transhepatic juke. Mr. Choppy explains to Professor Garage that the juke is better than the jelly, but Professor Garage has always done it this way and it's served me well for 40 years. Demonstrating simultaneously recall bias, the sunk cost fallacy, and the Semmelweis bias or Semmelweis response, being unwilling to overturn the existing treatment. If you don't know who Ignaz Semmelweis was, look him up, I'm not your mother. In the UK, the amount we get paid is unrelated to the tests or the treatments we order, so this removes a huge source of potential bias. But in countries where doing more tests equals more money, people order more tests. Now, this does not mean that they are bad people, nor that they are consciously thinking about money. Like all of these biases, this is unconscious, and it creates a system where being overly cautious and ordering more tests becomes the accepted norm. Contrary to popular belief, drug companies really don't pay doctors directly very often anymore. That's been clamped down on very hard. But Professor Garage recently was a keynote speaker at a medical conference in Bermuda. He was flown out there business class and gave a nice speech about his research, but the conference was sponsored by Big Jelly. Timmy needs an operation. Mr. Choppy tells him there's a 90% chance of survival completely okay. And Timmy's happy. Debbie is worried about her patient and wishes he didn't have to have surgery. And when he asks her advice and they discuss it, she mentions a 10% risk of death, which obviously is exactly the same statistic that Mr. Choppy has told him, but this really freaks Timmy out. The way we describe something to a patient can affect their decision or their feelings about it. This is called framing bias. Mr. Choppy does not accept free flights or meals from medical companies. He's a very scrupulous doctor. However, a new life-saving device has been shown to help people in a good, well-performed trial. Three companies make the new device. It's very expensive and hospitals are not doing many cases yet. One company, Pengshanks, run a training course free of charge to teach doctors how to use their kit, which Mr. Choppy attended. So even though Mr. Choppy is trying his best to be free of financial bias, he wants to learn this treatment because he wants to help his patients. And he's got no choice but to go on this training course, and obviously then as a result, he's most familiar with the Peng Shanks kit, so he's more likely to choose that one next time he's in an operating theatre. I could go on for another half hour, but I think between this video and the last one, we've covered most of the sources of cognitive bias when both practising and researching medicine. I feel sad when I hear a constant torrent of abuse directed towards doctors for putting money ahead of patients, because that just isn't the reality I know in any country. Of course, there are some bad apples, like in any profession, but tarring the whole group with the same brush is, in effect, another form of selection bias. And while I would never try to lessen somebody's bad experience with the medical profession, I guarantee that 99 times out of 100, it is not um, malice or personal self-enrichment that is the problem, but a systematic breakdown. And one part of that is unconscious bias. 
Simpson's paradox is the confusing phenomenon that arises when we find different directions of association between small groups and overall totals. Consider two treatments for kidney stones. I actually know the trial to which this pertains, which compared open surgery to keyhole surgery, but unfortunately it didn't feature one of my favourite terms in medicine, external shockwave lithotripsy, which I believe was the Alan Parsons Project's third studio album. So even though the percentages in the smaller group favour treatment A, the overall picture seems to favour treatment B. This is a trick used all the time, to mislead people by bunching statistics together to produce a false impression by ignoring confounders. The key one here being the fact that doctors are much more likely to refer severe cases with large stones to the open surgery group, and the milder cases to the keyhole group, and hence these two groups dominate the overall result, and the open surgery uh, group looks worse, because no matter which treatment you choose, the patients with larger stones don't do as well. Here's another quickie about misleading visualizations. The increase in house prices here looks linear, right? But don't fall for it. Look how unevenly spaced the time intervals are. To learn more about how stats can deceive, go check out the rest of the statistics module on Brilliant, as well as hundreds more questions on maths and science. Visit brilliant.org slash medlife and sign up for free. The first 200 people to visit that link will also get 20% off the premium annual rate if they choose to upgrade. I want to give a special shout out to Alexander, who despite my frequent pleas that I would rather you guys signed up for sponsors than made any donations directly to me, still managed to become a patron and was successfully refunded. You're a top bloke, Alexander, but everyone, if you find these videos useful, instead of giving me money that I'll just spend on Taramasalata, all I ask is that you check out the sponsors, and that way you and I both get something out of it. A little follow-up about the patient I diagnosed with yellow nail syndrome. About 18 months later, he was readmitted to hospital. Of course, I remembered him. That was my moment of glory, but he understandably had seen so many doctors, so he didn't recognize me. So I smiled wryly as I was admitting him, and he said to me, oh, I've got a condition called yellow nail syndrome. It's very rare. You've probably never heard of it. And I said, well, actually, I was so lucky when Dr. Smith diagnosed me. And I was like, um... What? I had to actually get the old notes out of storage and show him my entry in my handwriting where I'd first queried it, and he just looked at it dismissively and said, no, Dr. Smith's been my doctor for 20 years, and he really shouldn't try to take credit for other people's work.